No prizes for being able to identify the machine in that picture. It is, of course, a laptop PC. Uh, as a good example of a modern computing device, it's running uh, Microsoft Windows. Does anyone here use Mac? Just out of curiosity, has anyone here got Mac? Use Mac? That's about one, one, one person ready to put up their hand. So, so PC, well, Windows, Windows PCs and Mac PCs are the two main home computing platforms and the ones most people use at home. Can anyone actually name some other operating systems? We'll actually come to operating systems later in the course, but other operating systems. Linux or Unix. BIOS is going back in history a bit. And Android, which is uh, what my phone is running. Interestingly, we'll come back to operating systems in a little while. What some of you may or may not know is that Mac, the Mac operating system actually runs at its base as you've got a version of Unix. Android has at its base a version of Linux, which is a version of Unix. Uh, and so there are other Linux operating systems. So sometimes computers that look very different actually have a lot in common underneath the hood. Uh, but they're all modern computing devices. Here's a modern computing device. Anyone identify that? Yep, that's a washing machine. So some people, some people have never seen a washing machine before. Um, or a cleaner, so. so here is a, a washing machine. We can set, choose, it's not really programmable. We can choose from a list of programs and there are settings there. And there's a digital display. It has been programmed, but the programs have been hard-coded in, so we can choose from a list of programs. I mean, there's a few other buttons we can do to set timers and change some settings. So it's not a programmable computer, but there's a computer in there, and it's doing stuff. So someone, someone in the world, in fact, quite a number of people, have as their job description, well, that might not be their job title, but basically what they do for their living is program washing machines. Someone has to do it. This... Yep, it's, it's, it's an oven. It's a cooker. This cooker actually has, it's not just a clock, it's actually, you can set programs in this, you can set timers, so you can set a wee alarm, so it's going to go off in 15 or 20 minutes. You can actually set programs, so you can actually program it to switch the oven on and off at set times. When you say program, it's not really a programmable computer, you can't change the program, you can't make it do arithmetic for you, you can't use it as a pocket calculator, you can't do a whole range of things, so it's very limited in its functions and programs it can run but it is some modern computing device. This one's quite easy. This is a camera, a digital camera. Digital cameras are actually quite complicated pieces of computing systems. There's quite a lot going on in a digital camera, and we'll come back and we'll see some of the things that go on in a digital camera later in the course. You see there's actually one of these menu options is says AI focus. So any idea what AI means? Artificial intelligence. If you've got a camera that does autofocus, you know, so basically it can automatically focus. Not, not focus free. Focus free is a camera that doesn't focus. It just has a set focal length. But if you've got a camera that does autofocus, and almost all digital cameras do, it's basically it's running an artificial intelligence program to do that. Okay? So there's quite a bit of programming goes into digital cameras so that it can detect whether or not it's in focus and it can adjust its focus to be correct. So there's Quite a lot of work goes into, into developing these. And there's obviously huge amounts of settings and different variations that can go on. And we've got our user interfaces, all these sort of buttons and dials and, and things on the side. So there is a, certainly the, all of these devices will have some kind of processor. Might be quite limited, but they all have some kind of processor. The digital camera will actually have quite a, a, a relatively fully featured processor in comparison to the washing machine and the cooker, which are very simple. This is actually quite a bit more complicated. Does anyone not know what this is? So everyone knows it's a games console. This is actually one of several available in the market. This is a Sony PlayStation 3. Clearly it's programmable. You can get by programs on disk, so you can download programs via the PlayStation Network. You can do similar things with the Xbox and also the Nintendo Wii and with the previous generations of games consoles. This is actually a very powerful computer in uh, terms. I mean, PCs constantly get developed, whereas this is a few years old now, but the hardware in this is actually really pretty powerful stuff. And so that's another common example of a computing system. If the hardware on the PS3 is more powerful than, say, a modern computer, why is it that the PS3 is so much less expensive? When I say modern computer, if you, 
a, a computer that came out at the same, that was available at the same time as the PSC came out, because the PSC is fixed, if you remember. PSC is fixed. But one of the things is that all games consoles, particularly the Microsoft and Sony ones, they actually subsidise the cost of them, at least initially, because the, this is another story altogether, but they make their money primarily through software sales. So there is a very, very, very tight, in fact, initially, there's probably a loss-making machine. It probably takes a few years until the production processes come down and the costs of production are cheaper. But probably for the first few years, certainly for the first year of production, the PlayStation 3, they were probably losing money every time they sold one, making money every time they sold some software. So yeah, so the original, that's the original, sorry, that's the slim hardware. So the hardware got redesigned to be cheaper. But the original release would have actually been more, more expensive. But yeah, it's got a very powerful processor in there called the Cell Processor, which is actually... Another thing we're going to look at later. Just to ask, what other computers do you use? So I've shown a range of computers. What haven't I shown up there? Smartphones. So, so this is a computer. Calculators are very limited computing devices. We tend not to call, but yeah, obviously they have processors in them. So, so it, digital calculators, if you've got a dedicated one. Calculators. Smartphones, anything else? Televisions. Modern televisions. A lot, a lot of modern televisions will have processors in them, and in fact you can buy televisions now that have got built-in internet access, so as long as you can have an internet connection, your TV can be your web browser now, now as well. Anything else? Digital clocks, yep, and digital clocks and watches, again, will have very, generally very simple processors, but again, they can have processors in them, or are likely to have some kind of processor in them. Anything else? Cars. Yeah. Cars, yeah, cars. Almost any, any modern car has basically an engine management computer in it. So forget the stereo, that'll have a computer in it. Forget other entertainment devices it might have that'll have computers in them. The engine has an engine management computer. So cars all have processors in them. So a car, when you include the stereo and the entertainment systems and the engine management computer, potentially other computers for managing other aspects of the car itself, there'll be a number of processors in a car. Anything else? Automatic doors. They probably wouldn't have processors. They're, they are very, very simple sensors and circuits, so they probably don't qualify as computers or, or that. They probably, they probably fall just a bit short of quite simple circuits. If you read, Hitchers, read or watch or um, listen to Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, there are doors in that science fiction series that have personalities and will talk to you, but that's probably not, not required, so most, uh, most uh, doors with sensors now will. Anything else, sorry? Yeah, so we come to DVD players and set-top boxes, so your Freeview box as well. Because Freeview boxes, think about what they have to do. They receive, usually it's actually an encrypted digital signal, you have to decrypt it, so there's a fair bit of processing goes on there. So again, there's processors and things like your set-top boxes, DVD players, huge amount of stuff around your house. So in your house, before this lecture, you probably thought to yourself, how many if I was to say, how many computers do you have in your house? You would think purely about in terms of PCs or laptops, probably. But now you're hopefully realizing that computers, depending on how we want to define what is a computer and what is not, we might be including a whole range of digital devices, so we might be upping that number quite dramatically. And then there are other types of computers altogether. Terms you may have heard of are like grid computing or cloud computing. So has anyone heard of a project called SETI at home? It's one two, three, but four, but four people, or folding at home, or again, another few. There's a range of these different projects. What folding at home is a project that's aiming to use the power of lots and lots of computers to solve, to help processing, to help find medicines and help cure diseases. Now, how it does that is there's a bit of software that you can download and run it your computer at home, and your computer at home is going to talk to some server on the network, server on your network is going to say, here's a bit of the problem. It sends a chunk of a much bigger problem, so it's a small chunk of a problem to your PC. Your PC processes that, and when it solves it, it sends it back. And so your PC is, in a sense, becomes one tiny component of a much larger computer that is spread over the whole internet. And anyone that downloads the folding at home the computer, whenever it goes to the screensaver, when they're not using their computer or perhaps overnight, the computer sits away, does processing, and becomes part, in a, in a sense, of a sort of virtual supercomputer. So we have grid computing where we have one computer that's actually made up of 
hundreds or thousands or even tens of thousands of different machines all over the internet, all over the world, solving one problem. And so there's a range of these. So there are, most of the big projects are actually focused on uh, researching new medicines or trying to understand various diseases and, and, and other aspects. But you get other projects doing other things. I mean, the first of these projects to take off was very geeky because it was SETI at home and SETI is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. So it was the astro uh, amateur astronomers trying to take the very challenging problem of analyzing all the radio signals that seem to bounce in from space and trying to analyze all these signals and, and try and work out, are any of these signals possibly intelligent signals? Or are they just noise? And these are really, really big problems. They take huge amounts of processing. The effective power of many of these projects is actually more powerful than the most powerful supercomputer in the world. So we've got, in a sense, a virtual computer that the people running these projects, it costs them relatively little. It will cost them some amount because they have to maintain servers. They have to develop the software. But for a relatively modest cost, they get the power of a really powerful supercomputer. Cloud computing is a little different. Instead of someone on the internet using your PC to do their processing, it's kind of the other way around. You're sitting at your computer doing word processing or image editing or even video editing, but it's actually happening uh, somewhere else on the internet. It's actually being done on a server somewhere else. So if you use, for example, Google Docs, gives you a word processor and spreadsheet, the documents are saved on the internet, but also the key processing is actually done. You've got a local client, but the key processing is actually done on the internet as well. And you get online image editors. So your web browser becomes a sort of client, a user interface, but the computing power, the main computing power exists on the internet. And again, that happens for video services as well. And it's basically called cloud computing in the sense you think of the stuff out there on the internet as being some kind of cloud of machines. And it's kind of vague, and you don't, it's not a very well defined from your point of view of where those machines are. And indeed, when you use Google, you might be, one day, one day you might log into Google Mail and you'll be using a particular server in one part of the world. Next day you log into Google Mail, it's still your same Google Mail account, but it might actually be using a completely different server, some other part of the Google infrastructure and network. And it's very amorphous and hard to define, so it's why where the term sort of cloud comes from. Does anyone know what this is? PlayStation 3s. Yep. These boxes are all PlayStation 3s. This is one of the world's fastest supercomputers, and it is made up of, you know, sometimes be reported as 1,700, it's actually in total, a little bit over 2,000 PlayStation 3s. Because the PlayStation 3 sold as a consumer piece of equipment, because the cost is partially subsidized, because of the particular processor architecture that it uses, it's very well suited towards supercomputing tasks but much, much cheaper than it would have been if they'd bought sort of dedicated cell processor units. This is run by um, US Department of Defense. I think it's actually part of the Air Force have got it. You can no longer buy this because the new PlayStations don't run Linux. So this uses the Linux operating system and the new PlayStations don't run Linux. But it cost them a fraction of the normal cost of a supercomputer. One of the cheapest supercomputers there is in the top 500 list of most powerful supercomputers in the world, but it's actually a very high performing one. Uh, unfortunately, for potential supercomputer builders, Sony took out the ability to run Linux on, on their PlayStation 3, so you can't do this anymore. But a anyone wanting, to, anyone wanting to, to buy these and run, the, run these uh, in a very large setup would have to maintain by the service agreements. So even if someone is hacked, uh, the PlayStation 3 to allow you to run Linux regardless. If you're doing, if you're someone like the government, you kind of have to keep to the rules a little bit. On the other hand, this is a different sort of computer. This is a picture of a computer room. This machine that's covered up here, this is a kind of electrically powered calculator, but it's not a computer. What we can actually see in this room, there are actually six computers we can see in this room. I think the one at the front is called Frida. These people are computers. That was a job title. I went to, until nine, as recently as 1949, computer could be a, someone's job title. It would be someone who processed data. If you think things like 
trying to calculate missile firing distances, calculate how much fuel an, an aircraft might need to be able to reach a certain distance based on its weight and various other factors. Some of these are hard problems that you can compute. You can, if you've got the equations, you've got the numbers, you can go through and calculate and get the answer. And computers make that very, very fast. Modern computers make that very, very fast. In the 40s, people still needed to do these calculations without electronic computers. And so people did the calculations. Yes, if you can have someone live long enough and give them enough paper and pens that never run out, a person can operate as a Turing machine if they follow the program correctly. So, so we can simulate and emulate Turing machines. If we've got a, a given a Turing machine program and the rules, and we know the rules and we're given the tape, we can pretend to be that Turing machine and we can do that. But uh, to be Turing complete, we also have to potentially live forever. But yep, so, but computer was a job title. It was a job title certainly in the 1900s, and as we see here, it was still someone's job in 1949 to be a computer. So the term computer's been around for a long time. And computers, the people, were employed to perform required calculations for commercial, industrial, and scientific needs. So many of the things that we use electronic computers for nowadays, people did. And in fact, sometimes you'd have rooms and rooms and rooms of people uh, doing some of these tasks. The people might use mechanical or electrical calculators. They would often use things like slide rules. They would use books of mathematical tables. Does everyone have at least some vague memory of, of a sine and a cosine from maths? So working out sines and cosines. And you, you know, you get, you've got an angle, you put an angle, you do sine of that angle and you get a number. Well, calculators make that very easy. Before electronic calculators, what you would get at school and what you would be using in business, you would actually have a book. You'd have a book and, it would, and you'd be able to look up. You'd say, oh, I want the sine. I want the sine of 89.27 degrees. So you'd flip through a book of sine tables until you find 87.29 or whatever. And that would have the number of the result. And someone would have that. So people would be using these tables, but also people would have to calculate these values to produce these tables. So these kind of books of mathematical results used to be very important for science and business and for commercial uses. In fact, that was the kind of calculations that something like the difference machine would have been ideal for, would have been for calculating these. I mean, it would been really, really dull for people to just work out all the different signs and cosines and work out all these different numbers. Sort of thing that, you know, a, a mechanical computer like a difference engine could have been very, very good for. But then the human computers would be using these results. But human computers are actually still in use today. So you know about catch buzz? You've sometimes, has anyone never had to type in some mangled text to leave a comment on the web or something like that? So, so you've all used to this idea that occasionally you go to some website, you want to leave a comment or register for a service, and it will show you some mangled text and say, type in this word. What that's doing is trying to stop people who've got spam bots, sort of AI, simple AI programs that are trying to spam the internet with links to uh, people who sell you pharmaceuticals over the internet and that kind of thing. Uh, that system's called CAPTCHA, Completely Automated Public Turing Test to Tell Computers and Humans Apart. Got a complicated name. There's a particular one of these CAPTCHAs that shows you two words, and that's the recapture. Now, what recapture is doing is one of the words it shows you is being used to test, are you human? So it's using one of those words to say, can you correctly identify this? If you can, then I think you're human, and I'll let you use this service. And the second word it uses is a word that some book service, so some, some, there's some people online who are trying to digitize large collections of books. They've got large collections of books, they're trying to digitize, digitize these old books so that they're going to be available on the internet in the future. But they found some words difficult to get correctly. They're smudged, or there's funny symbols in them, or there's something wrong. And one of the words, some of the words are hard for computers to identify correctly. And so what it's done is saying, it's given you one of those words. And so you are solving a problem for the computer. So with recapture, you're typing in two words. One is a test to test if you are a real commentator or a real user. And the other word, the computer is using you 
to solve its problem. It can't recognize the words correctly. So does that mean if you got the first word right and the second word wrong, you could potentially screw up their experiment? You could, but it serves them in a random order, so you don't always know which one is which. You can sometimes guess which one is which, but you can't always tell for sure which one is which. What it will also do, it will also actually send the same word to different users. So it verifies the result against multiple responses, and it needs to get a certain number of the same before it says, okay, yeah, this is right. So make, to try and stop people messing with it, basically. So what this is doing is, in a very real sense, this is using human users as elements in a computer program. So the human computer is actually still with us, although it's a bit more subtle than it used to be, or at least in that case it is. Is there anyone here that knows that they've done one of these before? So is anyone quite sure? Yes. So, that's mo so, well, well, so most of you have done this. So that's so what, what makes the first one capture? What makes that a Turing test? Right. So someone's actually asked about Turing test. So Turing test is something else. So ch ch all a Turing test is, again, it's Alan Turing, whose name is already mentioned earlier today. There's lots of versions of Turing tests. What Turing test is particularly is about what the point of the Turing test is about, is to tell apart a person from a machine. So it's not a traditional Turing test at all, but it is a test to tell apart a person from a machine. So that's the principle. There's another service online from Amazon. Now, you may or may not be aware that Amazon don't just sell things through the internet. Amazon are actually also a web company. So Amazon are, a, for example, a company that do some very advanced web hosting as a cloud-based service. Amazon set, have something called also the Compu Amazon Compute Cloud. So you can run very large, diff difficult programs. You can have them running on Amazon's machines instead of your own. Um, and that's all done through an online interface. And they also do uh, web hosting. So you can, if you've got very large files you need to share, you can do that again through Amazon, and Amazon can become the distribution service for your web uh, site and web services. They also provide something called Amazon Mechanical Turk. Now, this is a web service. I encourage you to go and have a wee peek at it. A sort of distributed AI, artificial intelligence computing platform. And there's a programming API, so you can uh, try and integrate it with your own web-based or internet-based programs and applications. But as Amazon call it, it is actually artificial, artificial intelligence. You have some kind of challenging task for a computer to do. You submit it automatically via some program. You can also do it just through a web, web interface. But you can link it up to your own program so that things get submitted automatically to it. But the problems are actually solved by human users. So you post your problem up, and you say how much you're willing to pay to get it solved. And then it's actually people that do the solving not computer. So Amazon call this artificial, artificial intelligence. Uh, so you can go and have a look at Amazon's mechanical Turk. And as you'll note, the name is obviously inspired by the Turk, which we saw earlier, the, the chess playing bot, automaton. So it comes to all of this, what is a dictionary? Well, I've taken this uh, definition from Wiktionary, which is run by the same people that run Wikipedia. And they've given two definitions. One, the modern one, we have some programmable device, so a computer as opposed to a calculator. The general definition of a, of a computer tends to be something that's programmable, performs mathematical calculations and logical operations, uh, especially one that can process, store, and retrieve large amounts of data very quickly. So not necessarily one that can do that sort of processing, but especially. Now, obviously, for many of you, what you're interested in is the fact that those mathematical calculations and logical operations mean that you can play Drake's Fortune or uh, Call of Duty or some other game on it. Uh, and the dated definition of computer is a person employed to perform computations. Before I go into this detail, are there any questions about the stuff I've talked about today? The exam is worth 60%. Class tests are going to be worth 40%. Everyone's on Blackboard, that's good. Using the Blackboard discussion forum, because the people on this module are actually split across two campuses and three different, different deliveries. So some of you may be using other sites to communicate with lecturers or other people in your course, depending which course, course or modules you're on. But for this course, 
the only place to really post questions and ask things about the class is got to be really Blackboard. You can email me questions, but if there's any chance in the slightest that it's of, some, of interest to a wider audience, I'd encourage you to actually try and use Blackboard. Some, perhaps someone else may be able to answer it. I've listed three books for the course. These are also listed and linked to uh, on Blackboard. If you go to the module references link on Blackboard, there's links to these three books. The first one I've picked the required text. It's called How Computers Work. The reason I've picked this for the required text is it's quite an easy read. So there are books that are more detailed and go to a lot more depth. But I don't think it would make much point requiring you to buy a book that you wouldn't read because it was too boring. So I've said the required book is this one, How Computers Work. It's as readable as these books can possibly be. It's very colourful. There's lots and lots of pictures. Yay. Yep, so that'll keep you happy. So you can always amuse yourself. Uh, and also, it's cheap. So it's a cheap book. So it's about £15 online. So it's about £25 cover price, I think. But you can get it for about £15 online. Also recommended text. The Principles of Computer Hardware. So Principles of Computer Hardware by Alan Clements goes into a lot of depth on how processors work, how assembly language works, how a lot of the low level aspects of computer hardware works. Is probably a, a bit more narrowly focused on those aspects of the course. But it goes into the course, these things in a lot, lot, lot more depth. A lot more depth than How Computers Work. How Computers Work is a very shallow book. It covers a huge width huge range of topics, doesn't go very deeply into any of them. Pinto computer hardware is different. The other one I'm going to recommend is something called The Elements of Computing Systems. Elements of Computing Systems is quite unusual in that through software and emulation, what you do, if you were to follow the course in that book from chapter one through to the end of the book, you would in effect be building your own simulated computer from scratch. So it's quite impressive what it does. It would be quite a good challenge to undertake, I think. Both of these have a number of, a number of areas that we will be visiting in this course, but there's certainly a lot more in, in depth, and they're both a bit more expensive. Each week, I'll give you some reading, and I'll identify the different books. So the required reading for this week is from How Computers Work, just the first few pages. But there's also some further reading, and I've identified things that you could read. So Wikipedia, the entries on the history of computing and related articles. Principles of Computer Hardware, Chapter 1. And also, there's a Computer History Channel on YouTube. It's the Computer History Channel is actually from the Computer Museum of Computer History, which is in California. They've actually got some very well produced videos. We come to the... Computing Systems module on Blackboard. This is the module homepage, which hopefully you've all seen. If you click on module references, what you'll also see is that as we go through, for each week of the course, there will be a, list, a set of module references on Blackboard as well. So as well as this, the material that's linked to in the book, which links to chapters of other books, there's online links here. So for this week's material on history of computing, here's a bunch of different links. And, and things you can view. So, for example, there's a, night, a very well produced, very short video on Charles Babbage and the Difference Engine. And there's a range of other clips. There's some clips about the Colossus and Enigma. And Turing's bomb, or bomba, was actually the machine that was used to break the Enigma code. So there's this links on Blackboard to other online resources. And in each set of notes, I'll list links to appropriate sections of the three books that, I'm, that, that we're referring to. So the questions really for you for next week, what are the main components of a modern computer? What is it that the different components are doing and how do they interact? So we'll start looking more into the insides of the modern computer next week. This week is obviously different, but each week the required reading is to be read in advance of the class. Okay? So the idea is that you read ahead of the class. The chapters, the chapters on how computers work are not terribly long. They're not huge, big chapters. But if you can look over, read over, how computers work, chapters 1, 2, 5, and 6, there's some bits that you should skip. 
So some of those elements you should skip over, and there's also some further reading. And those are the credits for all the images that I showed you today.